Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to begin by saying it's a real pleasure to be invited to speak at the first Bertorelli Programme for Marine Science Symposium, and I'd like to thank all the organisers for putting together what's already been a great day. I want to start by introducing you to the Reef Shark team. Um, so much of the work I'm going to be talking about in the next 15 minutes or so is uh, the result of a strong collaborative effort between uh, ZSL here in London, but also Stanford University, Hopkins Marine Lab, headed up by Professor Barbara Block, uh, her team of Francesco, Robbie Shallot, uh, Nathan Trulove, uh, and Taylor Chappell, um, but also Aaron Carlisle at the University of Delaware, and David Tickler, who's featured quite prominently already in the first few talks at the University of Western Australia. He's becoming a bit of a celebrity. So I think it, it goes without saying, and it's been reiterated for each of the talks so far, that bio is a vast seascape. Uh, it poses a number of challenges, not just to how we monitor, but also to how we protect the species that reside within that. Um, it's it's, inter it's lar large areas of, of deep water, um, small islands and atoll systems, uh, and for the keen-eyed among you, you may have seen the manta ray in that short, short video. Uh, animals like that, as we've already seen, can transition very vast areas, and I'm particularly interested in how these animals connect the archipelago itself, what that means for not just their ecology, but also for their vulnerability to illegal fishing activity, which is still relatively pre prevalent within the reserve. So Barbara Block's done a great job of introducing this extensive acoustic monitoring platform, uh, and this forms a real core of the, the Reef Shark project. Um, at its height, there were 92 receivers distributed across the, the archipelago. Um, Barb's done a great job also of, of giving a, an overview of some of the data that we've had back from that. Uh, but just to reiterate, essentially we have these acoustic receivers, very simplistic technology. They're acoustic hydrophones, which we d typically put in diveable limits, um, and we moor these to midwater buoys, uh, and they are passive listening devices, which will stay in situ for anywhere between 12 up to 12 months. Uh, they're listening out for well over 400 tags that have been deployed now, uh, and if a, a tagged animal comes within 500 meters of one of these things, on, on, est on average, uh, it logs a time and a date, and it's, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, of course, the, this requires a lot of maintenance. We have to go back each year and uh, retrieve these devices, download the data, and fit them with new batteries. Um, but what it's enabling us to do is have this round-the-clock monitoring platform. Uh, and given the location of where, where BIO is, I think we can all agree that's pretty impressive. Aside from that, it gives us uh, a good insight into some static processes in these animals, so we can, we can start to begin to understand something about the, the residency of these animals, the space use and the, the, the periodicity with which they return uh, to certain areas of the reef, but also some more dynamic processes, such as the connectivity of the archipelago itself via animal movements. And we derive this from the departure, sequ departure and arrival sequences from the acoustic data set. Uh, and again, just to reiterate, the data set now currently consists of over 1.2 million uh, detections. And I, I think we can all agree that it's in the realms of big data now. Um, I just want to talk briefly about connectivity. Um, I'm very interested in, in networks myself. Um, and I think it's, it's often um, suggested that things like large companies, government departments can be greatly enhanced by increasing the connectivity of... of um, individuals within that, those departments. So people that require goods, services, information, how can they best be connected to those that can provide those sources? But it's also true to say that there is an underlying property of the ways in which things are structured that actually has quite a, um, a sway on, on whether that process is successful or not. Uh, and this is really where networks come in. It, they're they're a, a quantitative process for um, understanding complex systems, both at the individual level and how that relates to the overall structure, but also, uh, conversely, how the, the structural dynamics of uh, a movement network, for example, or a social network can actually impact an individual. Uh, and in network parlance, we tend to talk about nodes, and for the, for the remainder of this talk, these nodes will represent locations around biop. Uh, and the edges between those are typically the movements of animals that we've fitted with acoustic, with acoustic tags. Um, and this has really given rise, this understanding of, of complex interconnected systems to a whole uh, field of network science. And so there is a wealth of information out there that we can already learn from. Um, and so far, it's already revealed some extraordinary patterns in human behavior. Uh, and again, I like to draw on different 
uh, subject areas, especially where we already have vast amounts of telemetry data. So in the same way our animals are recorded whenever they go within 500 meters of one of our receivers, when we make a mobile phone call, it gets logged to a, a mobile phone tower, and this gives us a rough estimate of our locations. And so there's been some nice work by Barabasi's uh, lab to suggest that human behavior is actually um, incredibly regular, and it shows these kind of high spatial and temporal patterns uh, based on the telemetry data we get back from people making mobile phone calls. Um, equally, transportation networks, we have vast amounts of data, even just in London within the Oyster card system, for example. Um, but you may or may not know this, but 90% of trade is transported on the global cargo ship network. Uh, so Calusa et al. here were able to map that cargo ship network across the entire globe uh, and map the, the frequency of connectivity of each of those, those ports to suggest that um, there are a few, a disproportionately small amount of very highly connected ports. And this has really important implications for things like trade efficiency, spread of invasive diseases, and things like that. Now, you may be wondering why I'm talking to you about human processes and human mobility, but I think uh, Barbara's done a great job of showing that we have incredible technologies these days that are uh, being deployed in a number of um, amazing ways, but these are generating huge amounts of data, uh, and we really need to be working on, on analytical techniques that can handle these large data sets as well. And this is where we can, we can borrow uh, methodologies from different areas. But I'm, I'm interested in ecological networks. Um, so the, the spatial structuring of marine mobile megafauna has uh, very important implications, not just for reef health, but for ecosystem services uh, and for population stability as well. So we're particularly interested in how animals are connecting different parts of the reef, um, what the, dri the, the kind of uh, behavioral and environmental drivers of those processes are, uh, whether we can quantify those to measure ecological hotspots, uh, and also to assess how those movements and the structure of those movements impacts their risk to uh, illegal fishing activity. So the plot on the right here is three years, uh, well, your left, is three years' worth of uh, acoustic tracking data from grey reef sharks and silver tip sharks combined. Um, very simply, as an animal moves out of the range of one receiver and into the range of another, it maps a, an edge within our, our network. Uh, and if we do this concurrently over time and we create a weighted network, what we actually get is these areas of kind of pink to purple, which are highlighting these ecologically important hotspots where we see very high flow rates. Um, these areas are important for two reasons. The first is there's clearly a lot of activity there. So there's, there's some environmental drivers lightly driving the, the movements between these locations. And it's possibly known by the illegal fishing community that these are productive areas. Uh, and so not only should they be targeted at various times of year for, um, uh, for enforcement efforts, um, but it's also somewhere that we can look to to, to, um, to, yeah, to increase our enforcement. Again, Bob mentioned the seamounts down, down in the south and to the west of um, Diego Garcia. Um, we were able to utilize relatively new VEMCO technology with acoustic release receivers where we can deploy receivers in much deeper waters uh, and acoustically retrieve those devices after a year. Uh, these were put in really with an interest to see to what, what role do these seamounts play in um, transitioning animals between different parts of our, our acoustic network and between the different atoll systems. Um, this was just the tail end of, of the movement networks from the manta rays. We can see there are occasional movements by our tag mantas, which were tagged predominantly in Solomon Atoll in the north and Egmont in the west, um, that they do occasionally visit these seamounts. The grey reef sharks, as yet, although we have a tagging bias again in the northern atolls and over towards Egmont, we've yet to see them make this transition to the seamounts. However, the, the species that we would perhaps suggest is much more roaming. Uh, the, the silver tip sharks, they do tend to favor activity in and around these seamounts. So there's clearly something of interest here for more pelagic associated species. They're highly productive areas. Uh, we, we get an incredible amount of detections on these receivers. Um, so that there's quite residential activity at these, these specific receiver stations as well. So we, we were interested in looking at how the spatial ecology impacts threat to illegal fishing activity. And so we predominantly looked at the two species that we tagged most frequently. That's the grey reef shark in the top uh, and the silver tip in the bottom. And we use linear mixed effects modeling to try and estimate um, upper boundaries for 
potential activity spaces for these animals. And we were able to determine that grey reefs, on, as, on average, um, would have an activity space of roughly 58 kilometres, um, and nearly three times that in the silver tip shark. We were also able to model the, um, over on the right here, model the, the movement networks to, to see to what extent uh, distance decay function would actually predict the dynamics of the, uh, the structure of that movement network. And again, we were able to show that um, using random starting locations across our acoustic network, the, the majority of the movements made by the species that we tagged are actually quite predictable. And again, this is helping us build an evidence case for where we might suspect these animals to be uh, in the future. We were very fortunate, again, to, to work quite closely with MRAG, who, um, the Marine Resources Assessment Group, who were able to provide us with a pretty extensive map of spatial risk across the, the MPA. Um, so the colourful figure on the left-hand side here um, is a, a 0 to 50 scale in which a, a risk has been assigned to a 0 0.1 degree grid cell across the whole reserve. Uh, that score is based on a whole host of different factors from previous illegal activity to distance to reserve boundary to uh, tra transit routes uh, and whether there are islands present within that grid cell as well. And you get this, this kind of heterogeneous map of risk across that area. We then wanted to overlay what we knew about the behavior of these animals, both their acti wider activity spaces, uh, their movement networks that we were able to monitor directly from the acoustic array, and also their residency patterns within these areas to be able to um, essentially say that the silver tip shark, which we know to have these much more dispersive dynamic movements, and they link many more of the, the reef systems, um, are actually, that, that connectivity is positively, significantly positively associated to increased risk of illegal fishing activity. Uh, and this was to some degree confirmed in December uh, 2014 when I think 15 of our acoustic tags stopped transmitting all on the same day, of which 13 of those were silver tip sharks. Um, so this, this is adding some evidence as to why that might be the case. So we're really just scratching the surface. The, the data continues to grow. There are a number of different directions we might wish to, to take with this. Um, We've certainly been working on a number of different methods for inferring aggregation and social behavior, which is another uh, particular interest of mine. Um, so we've been developing machine learning approaches um, that we apply to our detection profiles at each of our receiver locations to construct um, social interactions, essentially. And we're able to map these social interactions of gray reef sharks in this instance, which we know form these large, uh, large aggregations that make them particularly vulnerable to mass capture. We can map these social interactions through time and not only understand how movements generate this kind of spatial connectivity, but also how the population might be connected um, via the kind of social aggregation information as well. Again, we were fortunate enough to, to get the, the movement tracks of the BPV over the last, I think, between uh, 2013 and 2016, which overlaps perfectly with our most data-rich period. Um, so we're really trying to drill down now into trying to understand the extent to which we see spatial and temporal overlap in enforcement effort with the areas and times that we know to be important ecologically for the animals that we're tracking. Um, there's still plenty of work to be done on this, and we continue to look forward to collaborating with MRAG and or the, um, the future contract holder for enforcement within BIOP. Uh, and then my only... Uh, final point is that we're very keen to also understand some of the environmental drivers of these processes as well. So how is um, satellite remote sense data driving some of these spatial patterns in sharks? Um, and Michael Williamson is a PhD student. He has a poster in the map room. I highly recommend you go and have a look at it and go and speak to him. Uh, and he's going to be leading on some of this work over the next few years as well. And with that, I'm going to move on. <laughs>